everybody, this is Jeremy Siskin. I am the author of this beautiful book, Playing Solo Jazz Piano. Um, and I'm here with a dear friend, uh, John Mortensen. And John is one of, let's say, the world's leading experts in classical or sometimes called historical improvisation. Um, and so we're going to do a little bit of an interchange, interview one another um, to talk about the differences between what he does and what I do as a jazz imp improviser. So uh, welcome, John. Thank you so much, Jeremy. I'm really looking forward to talking about this and um, not just for our viewers, but just for myself to learn about how you think in terms of improv and, and to talk about some of the things that are similar and some of the things that are different between our two worlds. And um, let me just review for people who don't know you. I believe like you're You've got a lot of qualifications, of course. You're a long-time professor at Cedarville University in Ohio, but you're also now the author of a textbook on historical improvisation. Is that right? Right. And you held a book up, so I think I can also hold see, a book up. See your book. I don't know if I can keep up with you with all this flashing of books, but he, here it is. It's called the, yes. the Pianist's Guide to Historic Improvisation. Um, and I did just finish another one. It's in the review process with the publisher. Um, I printed off my own and it doesn't look like anything. It's just a big stack of papers. It's called Improvising Fugue. Wow. And uh, and it's it kind of, well, I don't want to talk about it too much, but it combines the insights of what's called the Partimento tradition with what you have to know when you improvise fugue. So that should be out uh, within probably a few months. So Amazing. I can't wait. Um, I guess... You know what I want to start with um, is your why and why classical improvisation or historical improvisation. And let, let me tell you the context for my question, which is that for me, improvisation is so deeply about self-expression and about being able to express yourself in the moment. Um, yeah. And there's something and I, I prepared to be corrected. <laughs> um, you know, there's something about, you know, this idea of historical improvisation, which feels not so much about self-expression as about kind of maintaining a tradition um, and doing things within a certain set of rules. So I guess my question is, one, am I wrong in that perception? I'm so ready to hear a yes that I am wrong. <laughs> um, and second, so what, then what is your why? Is it about self-expression or is it about something else? Well, you, you're not wrong, um, which uh, I'm happy to say, because as you know, you're so rarely wrong, Jeremy. Um, <laughs> Thank you. You're not wrong about the rules. Uh, all harmonic languages have rules. Um, this set of sounds is part of the language. That set of sounds is not part of the language. When you have this sound, you can go to here, 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 uh, but you can't go there from this sound. And the historic thing has the same kind of stuff as jazz, but just more strict because a lot of the development of music history is, is the acceptance of more types of dissonance, actually. So one of the big things that they would argue about is, um, can a fifth have a third and make a triad? And is that really consonant? Can, can we do that? Uh, okay, we can do it in the middle of a piece, but can we do it at the end of a piece? Well, we can do major, but we can we do minor? We're not sure. Um, then comes the seventh, when you have a cadence and a dominant chord. Do you have to prepare the seventh by common tone or can you just jump to it because uh, and then on and on and on. And then suddenly Debussy is playing half diminished chords with no preparation of anything. Uh, a great example of this, by the way, is the blues, where all dominant sevenths are now consonant. Um, so, you know, I just, there's, it's a wonderful kind of thing to, to study and explore um, when you play music of various uh, styles. And so when you go back to the 18th century, yeah, a lot more things are rule bound and, and you can't just do them willy nilly. Um, the biggest one is the preparation and resolution of dissonance. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a big job to handle it for sure. And what you get in return if you do it is you get the language, that beautiful language. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of rules and you spend a lot of time working on rules. As far as self-expression, yeah, I, I would say 100% it's self-expression, 100%. All art works within rules, and 
and anyone in that art form is going to get used to those rules and doesn't think of them really as restrictions, um, just as the frame of the picture. You know, I'm going to paint within that. And in some ways it's limiting, but in some ways it's freeing. But so that part of it, I would say, yeah, there's, there's a strong element of self-expression in it. Um, so now I got to ask you something. Uh, you have somewhat positioned yourself in kind of what I would call the, you know, the golden age of jazz somewhere between um, swing and bebop inclusive. And really you go back and I, I hear you do a lot of um, stride piano, which is, you know, a very early style. Uh, when you want to move outside those languages what do you use as rules? Because I know you don't just go the heck with everything, nothing matters. But when, and I've heard you do this kind of thing, improvising on Paul Simon, or um, I heard you once do a really long 30 minute nonstop epic display of genius thing. Um, what is it that you go after for rules when you're going beyond swing and even bebop? Yeah, so no, it's interesting to hear you talk about rules um, because I think you are right that any style, whether it's Baroque music of whatever century Baroque happened in or, you know, bebop of the 1940s, there are certain kind of rules of the road. Um, that said, as jazz musicians, I think we like to think about the rules less and internalize them orally rather than internalize them from a theoretical perspective. Mm -hmm. I think now that jazz education is, you know, kind of advancing and becoming more formal in the institution, of course, yes, we have classes about jazz theory where we do formalize um, things and help to kind of give somebody a little bit of a push in the direction maybe of a certain scale or a certain, you know, chord type. Um, but I think, and, you know, uh, I might throw this question back to you at some point, but for me, when I'm playing, I don't want to be thinking about those rules at all. And in fact, the best moments are when I completely forget what the style is supposed to be, um, or, you know, I guess even though those words supposed to be would completely vanish and I'm completely following my ear um, and whatever, emo whatever the emotional content is. So the answer to your question is that, you know, I think I've internally processed or an orally process, a lot of information that might come across as rules. But if I'm doing something that, you know, is not historical in the sense that I'm trying to really match Oscar Peterson's style or really match Thelonious Monk's style or really match Teddy Wilson's style, um, I'm not thinking about those kinds of things. Um, I'm not thinking in a theoretical way. Hopefully what I'm doing is I'm A, trusting my ear, B, thinking about emotional prompts, you know, maybe the lyric of a song or if I'm doing a completely free improvisation, I'm thinking about a poem or a painting or an experience I had in my life. Um, and then three, maybe thinking about a handful of small musical goals um, so that there's some kind of content that I'm aiming for. And the musical goal might be going from softer to louder, right? Or it might be making each section different, you know, giving some kind of a different presentation of each section. Or it might be, um, I'm going to limit myself to two voices for the first chorus of the piece. Um, or it might be, I'm going to, uh, you know, start out of time and get into time, right? You know, these kind of small, really basic things that just help to give, for me, some kind of a frame to the picture, like you're saying. Um, but yeah, for me, um, the goal would be that it's not like at all an intellectual exercise that if there's rules, I don't want to know them. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. Actually, this is a great quote by Kenny Wheeler, the tr great trumpet player, flugelhorn player, and you know, one of the, our most beloved jazz composers who said, you know, if I have a process for writing a tune. I don't want to know it. <laughs> I want to be able to, uh, to, uh, you know, approach each compositional experience, each creative experience from a completely fresh place because otherwise maybe I get into these same patterns. So throwing it back to you, um, and I think this might be a short answer, but it seems like that's a big difference between what the two of us do. 
that that's almost antithetical. You want to know that process. You need to follow the rules. Yeah. That, that's what gives you a sense of that you're doing the style correctly uh, or that you're doing the style in a legitimate way. Yeah. Um, the, the, I think the similarity is that the, the farther along you are, the looser you can hold those rules because you're so baptized in them that they're going to inform what you do, whether you think about them or not. You know, sort of like us sitting here, we're both native English speakers. Neither of us, until I bring this up now, has thought about adverbs or sentence structure. We, we don't need to think about it. That doesn't mean it isn't there. It's just so internalized that, that it hasn't come up as an issue. And I, I do think you're right that in the historic field, it takes longer and you, you can afford to forget less, but the same process does take place uh, where years and years and years of hearing things and knowing how it all works kind of come together and you can, you can just play. But yeah, I, I do. I, I, native speaker of that language. Yeah, yeah language. More, more and more. Bob it, or swing. Or, yeah, uh, it, it's more, I think it's harder to get there in the classical realm because even a beginning jazz student is immediately learning things by ear, you know, whether it's just 12-bar blues, they're learning to get off the page, hopefully. You know, with a good teacher, they're learning to get off the page. Um, you know, our, our mutual friend, um, Brad, from Columbus, Ohio, um, he talks about on-page and off-page musicians. And I think this is a very helpful way of talking about it. Classical musicians are so on-page uh, they come from schools where, you know, you study the score with a microscope and you talk about every dot and stuff. Um, and you respect the score as this almost like scripture or something, this word from on high, you know, Beethoven said it, uh, that it forms you into someone who doesn't really think for yourself about how music is made. Even if you know a lot of theory and you know a lot of cheering facts about Roman numerals, you don't really think in real time about how to build this stuff. You think in real time how to remember it and, and reconstruct it. And so to take that all away and say, now you're, you're the one who has to construct it, that's like going back to kindergarten for classical musicians. And so it just takes longer for them. You know, many of them come to it in adulthood and now they have to go back and learn this stuff. It just takes way longer to get that same level of comfort and fluency as opposed to a kid who grows up going to jam sessions uh, and doesn't have to sort of relearn anything. So that's, that's one of the big challenges right. is just getting over ourselves. Right. And that brings me to the question of where did you start? I know you're kind of an exceptional character because you were already improvising. And then, you know, what's the first thing you do with a student who might yeah. be wanting to learn to improvise in a classical or historical way? Yeah. Um, I have a very normal education as a classical pianist. I went to big state schools and got the regular performance degrees. And I have a normal job as a piano professor. So I'm, I really have no business doing any of this. <laughs> Um, probably I would say it's because I have a very short attention span. And I just started to get uncomfortable with the static quality of the way classical music is done. I love classical music. I love the repertoire. I love the history. I love all of that. And I have a lot of heroes who just play the same Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms year in, year out. I mean, it's great. I love it. But for me, I just... To say that everybody's going to play the same thing from the list, note for note, year after year after year, to me, my soul just dies. And so I actually started learning jazz for myself a number of years ago, just quietly reading and practicing. And, and then I would try a number or two on a, you know, to mix together with Beethoven or something. Uh, and, and after a while, I just thought, you know, what if you could take that spontaneity of you play the first chord without knowing where this piece is even going to go? You know, that leaping off the cliff uh, feeling. Uh, what if that could be taken into classical music? And the more I started looking into it, the more I thought, well, this the more I realized this is what they originally did. This is how they were trained. They did improvise. And our age is kind of a, a bizarre outlier that we, all we do is reproduce and recite. So that 
really led me into exploring more and more and wondering, could this become something that we actually do on stage? Could it be something that we teach? Um, could it be something that becomes available to a lot of people? So that's really where it came from. Sheer boredom. Right. And then I guess my question is, you know, besides purchasing all of your books, including the forthcoming one, what would be the first step for somebody who's improv curious? <laughs> um, the way I teach it now is I teach the Partimento system, which was taught in the Neapolitan conservatories, uh, Naples, Italy, and then uh, also in other places in Italy, like Bologna and Rome. And then it was taken. They just stole the whole thing when they founded the Paris Conservatory. They took the entire Italian system, just boxes and boxes of materials and just started the Paris Conservatory. And so you can see it continuing uh, all the way up to WC and Ravel. They're still using some of the same materials. Uh, and what Partimento is, it's where you learn the whole language, the harmonic language, by playing only from bass lines. And this overlaps with jazz in kind of a fascinating way, because in jazz, you learn from chord charts, right? You have this minimal skeletal information, and you're supposed to know all this stuff that goes with it. So if, if it says C sharp minor seven, F nine, F minus nine, uh, B major seven, like you're supposed to know a whole bunch of things about that. Um, and what a jazz musician knows, aha, that's a two, five, one, and it's in the key of B. And instead of playing this chord, I could actually substitute this chord. And here's the scales that are going to go with it. So from this tiny little shorthand, you know all this stuff that'll, and, and you know how to play a hundred ways. Partimento is the same thing. It's a bass line that has a range of correct upper voice accompaniments, not one correct thing, but a range and you learn to piece those things together in real time. So that's actually where I start. I start with the 10 partimenti of Giovanni Furno, who was one of the teachers in, in Naples. And that's where the students really learn this idea of just looking at a bass and going, aha, I, I see what I can do. So I, I, I tell them it's a three-step process, recognize, realize, stylize. You recognize by the way the bass is moving, what the implied harmonies are. You realize them in block chords. You just chunk them out. And then you stylize. You start to break it up into different voices and different rhythms. Uh, so that's where I tell people to go first. And then after that, more difficult partimento and stylization and then counterpoint. So I'm going to ask you the same question. Um, let's say a classical player comes to you. Somebody, somebody who really can play. You know, they've played you know, maybe you have a degree in music, in piano, and but they've never ever played jazz. What What's the first thing that you give them? Yeah, so this is a great question. And I'm working on a book that's in its final processes uh, for just this student. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I should be qualified to answer it, but it's an incredibly difficult question because there's all these things that you have to uh, start to internalize. You have to, A, be able to read chord symbols. B, understand jazz rhythm and swing rhythm and articulation, and C, start having some kind of an encounter with improvisation, right? So there's not one right answer, there's multiple fronts, you know, you're almost fighting a war on all of these different fronts. Um, but, you know, probably the first thing, the first couple things that I do, um, we, I like to start people with um, what I call drone improvisations, where mm -hmm. you just play maybe a low fifth and just have them improvise. And usually I start on C so that they, you know, with a C major scale so that we don't have to really think about notes and just have them start playing. And then I give small little focus prompts. Um, and at this point, we're not even thinking about the style of jazz. I'm just trying to get them to improvise melodies that are intentional, that make sense, um, that have some variety in them. So I'll tell you some of the very first focus prompts that I like to give people when they're improvising. Um, the first and arguably the most important, even though it's simple, is are you actually listening to yourself when you improvise? Um, because so many students, especially from a classical background, as they start to improvise, uh, get into this, you know, they're just like, I'm doing it. They're wiggling their fingers. They're playing yep. the notes, but it's not connecting orally at all. 
Um, and so the first thing, you know, and I'll, I'll do a little, just I'll put on my timer for a minute and I'll say, okay, here's a minute. You have to improvise on C and intensely listen to yourself and actually register everything you're playing. Um, a second thing, and this also seems so basic, but it's so important. Do your phrases have clear beginnings and endings? You know, are you actually playing in phrases or are you playing what I call a diarrhea improvisation <laughs> where you basically are just playing a continuous stream of notes? Um, and a third one, which starts getting a little bit more technical is, are you playing with a variety of hand positions? Um, because a lot of students, even really advanced classical players, as they start improvising, do what I call the crab, which is basically just kind of staying in this exact same hand position and not using all the capabilities that they've learned by practicing scales, which involve crossing over and crossing under, or by expanding their hand, or by kind of keeping it in a more spread position. Um, and so, you know, I start with these kind of basic principles of what it should look like to improvise the piano you know, in part just to get them feeling like they can improvise, feeling like they can get into a little bit of a flow while improvising, getting it to be a little bit less scary, um, and then starting to build these positive habits. The other things that we would do in early jazz lessons um, are, you know, talk about swing style, play some scales in swing style, um, really try to get the eighth note articulation correct, which is, you know, a real re-education for a lot of classical pianists who are used to playing eighth notes even and thinking of the weight being on the beat. Um, you know, we're now gonna play uneven eighth notes with the weight going off the beat, so it's really kind of difficult. Um, and then, you know, we do talk about the theory, the maybe the recognized part of your, uh, of your triptych, um, where, you know, we'd start looking at lead sheets um, and, uh, and, you know, figure out how to decode all of these chord symbols and block out the chords. Um, now, the fourth thing, which is so important, and I've put, um, put this in every single chapter of my new book, is there's gotta be some listening. Jazz is an oral art form. And, you know, we, as teachers, it can be so easy, you know, there's so much to do. <laughs> there's so much to explain. Um, but actually hearing jazz and being able to kind of even just follow along with that lead sheet and get the style in your ear, um, I'm not being a very good teacher if I'm not including that in my curriculum. Um, so that's kind of, I guess I, I guess I now listed a fourth front of the war that I'm fighting, but there's a lot to do for a student who comes in for their first jazz lesson. Absolutely. Uh, and I, I like that you touched upon this idea of, of just getting them used to the idea of playing something that isn't preordained. Uh, I think this is the hardest thing with anyone who's had any kind of classical training. I call this the linear rhizomic struggle. Because when you when you learn to play a Chopin piece or something, how many correct ways are there through this piece? Well, there's one, every single right note. And anything that isn't on that correct line is, is wrong. It's a train wreck. So, you know, it's like a set of train tracks. Just stay on the tracks and do everything. And um, rhizomes are uh, grass, like, like uh, the roots that spread rhizomically. And of course, improvisation is that. It's this constant branching off into something else. I actually think there's almost like a neurological problem when you've played classical music in this linear fashion for years and years. It's almost like you haven't developed the neurons that just not only can make decisions, but enjoy the process of making decisions. Mm. So I think simple exercises, like you mentioned, are crucial for classical players. Um, you know, you, you think about... I, 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 oh, go ahead. Uh, well, by the time somebody actually plays something for you, you know, a Mozart piece or something, how many times have they played it in this identical way before they ever walk on stage and play it for you? You know, it's really kind of shocking to think about how hammered into this one version this really is. Um, and that's why the word recital kind of grosses me out a little bit. Um, because I love music so much, I'm very happy to recite some of my favorite stuff, mm -hmm. just like I might recite a favorite poem. But that's not the only thing I want to do with the English language. I also want to have informal conversations and react to things in the moment come up with clever insults for Jeremy, um, of course, 
Um, and that's that decision making, that spontaneous decision making, which is a very, very different mental process. Uh, when I was first working on Fugue uh, several years ago, I took during the summer, I would practice Fugue expositions for two hours every day. And my brain would actually hurt. My head would hurt. And I feel like I was it was like a muscle workout. You know, it's painful to build these new muscles. It was building these new pathways of how to make these decisions in real time. So I think it's the same between our two disciplines is just getting them, uh, getting them free enough where they can go this way or that way at any given time. Yeah, absolutely. I was going to interject and say, you know, I always tell my, I, I have quite a few classical pianist students who, you know, want to, transition or at least add to what they do. And I always tell them that they're courageous. Like it takes so much courage for somebody, you know, who's been a stage actor their whole life to go and try improv comedy, right? Um, you know, it takes a ton of, or to, you know, go and try to immerse yourself in another language and another culture. It's tremendously to me um, courageous. And I think it's probably equally courageous for somebody to try classical or historical improvisation, even though it might be a little bit more in the style in the academy that they're used to. Um, it still is this incredible leap of faith to do something where you might fail. And, you know, I think one of my biggest challenges with students um, is they're so afraid of a wrong note. Yep. Um, and part of the re-education that has to happen is to accept that and say, okay, we're going to think more about rhythm than this note or to think about, well, if you can resolve a note, is it really wrong? Which you know, I think it applies a little bit less to you than to me. Um, but, you know, to take away that fear of wrong notes. Of course, yeah. it's cliche to say nobody dies, you know, <laughs> when you play a wrong note. But it's so true that so many people are held back by the fear of pressing something down and having it, you know, have that dissonance. Yeah. And, and classical music is so driven by shame, mm. um, honor and shame. And, uh, you know, the very best person, whoever it is, gets the honor and everybody else gets the shame. One of my students, in, um, who's a dear friend of mine in Lithuania, we were talking about the Russian system. And uh, he said, 10,000 pianists under unbearable pressure. And out the other end, you get one, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Trifonov or, you know, whoever. Uh, yeah. Uh, it, it's it's kind of after all the pressure. Yeah, it's a kind of inhumane system. Uh, they play beautifully for sure. But um, so I end up, I have students who are fairly well-placed in the classical music world, um, faculty at conservatories, you'd know the names, uh, members of big orchestras, conductors, and they're doing this very much uh, under the radar. They're, they're, um, they wouldn't want it known they're beginners at something. Mm -hmm. uh, and I respect that, of course. I keep their identity very, very secret and all of that. But yeah, there, there's a surprising number of people in high places who, who don't want it known that they are becoming like a little child, you know, to learn something new. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, yeah, it's such an act of courage and faith. I, I love it. Um, so I was going to ask you, um, I don't know, are, are you okay to go for a couple more questions? I love it. Yeah, go for it. Okay. So one of the questions that I get asked a ton is what a jazz practice session looks like. You know, how do you actually sit down and practice jazz? Have you given, I'm sure you've given some thought to, you know, what a practice session looks like for um, somebody in the classical improvisation world. You know, if I have an hour, let's say a day to dedicate to becoming a great classical improviser, how would, you, how would I spend that hour? What would I actually do? Oh, it's a great question, and it, it very much depends on what you need to get done. Um, you know, in, I've seen you recommend all kinds of interesting things. Like, I, I think one time you said, um, play notes of a, of a key, E flat or something. You have to play one on every eighth note beat, not in a pattern, like not up, down, and not predictable, but random. And you have to go for so long a time. And this is just to generate the ability to create material because you have to have material in rhythm and you can't stop to fix it or doubt or you just have to be able to spit it out like an auctioneer. Hands ahead, 49, 49, 49. Uh, 
I, I thought that was brilliant. And it's very focused toward a specific task. Uh, and in, in my field, it's the same thing. You know, what, what is it you really need to do? One of the big things is um, buying time. Um, so that you can put off the next important decision and have time to think about what it should be. So if you look at how classical music is con is constructed, there are all these strategies for extending a harmony. Like take the Bach, the first prelude from the Well-Tempered Clavier, which I'm going to reach over here. Um, that's a C major chord. It's arpeggiated upward twice in five voices, in five implied voices. I mean, it's a lot of time to waste reiterating a C major chord. You could have just gone chunk and gone on to the next measure. And the temptation in playing this is to sort of, sort of blurt out every event and then quickly run on to the next one. And the ability to delay and let this one have its own little moment in the sun and a nice rhythmic feel, uh, that's actually a skill you really have to practice, similar to your E flat thing. So that would be one of them. Another thing, what I'm doing right now, I'm getting ready to improvise on um, the B A C H motive, um, the spelling of Bach's name, uh, which is really complicated harmonically because it's so chromatic. And I don't want to lock into one way of doing it. So I put on the metronome and I make myself improvise fugues in time. And everything is always scrambled, it's, you know, different order of keys and a different order of events. And, you know, sometimes I bring in the subject high and then go low. And sometimes I'll do it the other way. And what I'm doing is I'm just getting used to every possibility. So I don't even really care what happens. And it will be in rhythm. It will have a feel. So it's just very specific to the type of problems one has. So let me throw the question back at you. Speaking of, of practicing, um, if you were going to practice, well, I heard you one time, one of my favorite things you ever did. You did an entire program, solo piano. You improvised on Paul Simon and Duke Ellington. And the, they were very unconventional. They were very free, you know, not just find what the changes are in place all over. So what are you thinking about? Let's take Paul Simon. What are you thinking about when you get ready for something like that? Yeah, well, um, thank you for saying nice things about that. Um, I guess for, for me, especially in terms of solo piano, every piece is... And it feels cliche to say that every piece is is different, but every piece is truly different in terms of the amount of improvisation that's going to happen. Some pieces in that program, and probably in just about any program that I'm going to do, have maybe some part that we would call a set piece, where I know at least 90% of the notes that I'm going to play, and I practiced it yeah. so that, you know, and part of the practice is similar to what a classical musician might do preparing for a recital, right? Um, make sure that you know the notes, make sure that you can play them convincingly, make sure that they're memorized, etc. Um, other pieces maybe would be played more like a jazz standard, right? Um, where maybe it's a ballad, maybe it's a swing piece, um, and I need to know the changes, I need to, um, you know, I mean, at this point, probably for a program like this, I'm doing a lot of repetition. I, I have a share, a, you know, share exercises if I find myself stuck in a certain place that I might go to. And I'm happy to talk about some more specifics. Um, and then some pieces, um, you know, might be freer. Um, in which case, again, I have like maybe a different set of exercises if I'm doing something where you know I'm really um, starting from a harmonically free place or a rhythmically free place. Um, so I'd have to kind of take each of those you know, problems a little bit differently. Um, but I'll share some of the things that I, you know, might do. Um, I'm a, one of, the, one of my favorite exercises, you know, if I'm feeling stuck on a kind of standard kind of piece is to play just with my, my pinkies and thumbs so that I know I'm playing only four voices. And it's a really helpful limitation to me to hear it, to hear the music linearly. Um, rather than to think about the stacked kind of chord symbols. Um, I might practice with just two voices, just one in my right hand, one in my left hand. Um, again, to get out of whatever harmonic habits. I might transpose the piece to some different keys. Yeah. 
um, I, I might have told told you it's one of my favorite things that I've heard that my, my teacher Fred Hirsch says that he will not play a piece in a solo recital in the key he's going to play it in until he gets on stage because he wants that key to feel really fresh to him yeah. when he gets on stage. Yeah. And transposing is such a key exercise because it gets the intellectual side going, it gets the ear going, and it gets your fingers into different positions. So maybe you find a voicing that you haven't found before, um, uh, or you find you know a melodic pattern that wouldn't occur to you in E, but it sits so well in F that now you feel like you can bring it in that, you know, it's kind of activating something for your ear. Um, I do a lot of uh, what my teacher called outlining, which is playing only the notes, maybe for, or sorry, playing only one chord every four beats. I'm seeing, okay, can I make a really beautiful connection just every four beats and then increasing to, okay, now I'm going to put something in every two beats. Okay, now I'm going to try something every quarter note. So that instead of building something um, that, you know, is just going in straight linear, you're kind of building from the outside in, or maybe I should say from the inside, from the core of the harmony, from the core of the expression outwards. So as I'm getting ready for a solo recital, those are some of the exercises that I'll, I'll do. Um, other things, you know, right now I'm, about to go off to the Vail Jazz Festival, and I know that there's going to be some tune that's just way faster than I like to play generally. <laughs> um, and so I'm every day I'm starting my metronome at half note equals 125, and putting on a timer for three minutes, and choosing a tune, and then bringing up the half note until I get to 175, so 350 beats per minute, um, and just practicing teasing myself further and further into a faster tempo, so that I'm not completely overwhelmed as I get on stage and have to play some stupidly blazing fast tempo. Um, so those are some of the things that I do um, at this point in my career if I'm preparing for a performance or preparing for a recital. Um, so many of those overlap with, with stuff in my world. I mean, we use the play it and move the metronome up by one click thing all the time because you don't even feel it. Practicing a classical piece. Yeah, you trick yourself into learning how to do it. Um, the, the other thing I find so interesting is um, I'm, I'm guessing anyway that every once in a while you catch yourself using the same little idea or riff or time waster or I'm not sure what else to play. So this um, and it's almost like that moment is what propels you to go and rethink and listen and discover something new. Um, and it's almost like this crazy balance because you, ha you have to do it enough to get good at it. And then if it's really good and you love it, you depend on it and you use it. And then eventually you overuse it. And now it propels you to go find totally other solutions. And I just find that I, I encounter that all the time. Yeah, I don't know if you've encountered this, but I always encourage my students to try to practice past the point of boredom. You know, whatever the exercise is, if the exercise is, oh, I'm going to hit the third on the downbeat every chord, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's something that we would practice in jazz. Um, and so you can do that, like you said, until you find some patterns that you know work and you kind of, uh, you know, you get there. And if you're a good, dutiful jazz musician who, like you said uh, about yourself, uh, has a short attention span, uh, gets bored easily, what you want to do is you want to keep practicing that same exercise until you start finding, forcing yourself into different solutions, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and I find that really valuable because I feel like I can get to the point where I can kind of phone something in, but then I get to the interesting stuff once I have those patterns, but make a very conscious choice not to use them or to avoid them. Um, and that's where I find the real magic of my practice sessions um, <laughs> is when I get past the point of that, you know, standard thing, that, that thing that kind of bores me a little bit. And all of that... All of that assumes just this huge amount of time that you have to put in. It's just so expensive for time. Um, and uh, I did I did learn early on as a, as a, when I was a purely classical musician in undergrad, I learned to protect my practice time. I had it blocked out and highlighted, you know, in my daily schedule, and nothing else was allowed to to come and mess with that. Because um, if you, if you don't have that, you don't have anything. Yeah, and I'm not sure, exactly sure why this is occurring to me now, but just to bring back something earlier in the conversation, one thing that I say to my students, and I say in the introduction of my upcoming book, you know, we've talked about 
becoming a native speaker of a foreign language. And um, I guess, you know, I was thinking about it because you're talking about the massive amount of time and, you know, think about how much time it takes you if you set out today to learn French. I don't know if you speak French, but hypothetically, um, you know, you have to truly immerse yourself if you're going to become a native speaker. It's not a matter of you just get to take a semester of French class, right? You'll kind of, you'll know a little bit of French after a semester of French class, but you have to take four semesters and then you have to go there and study abroad and immerse yourself and talk every day. And, but to me, like that's to just do it. When I hear from, in my world, Miles Davis or Bill Evans or Oscar Peterson or Keith Jarrett, these people are not just speakers of this language. These people are poets, yeah. right? Like, so not only are they speakers of the language, but they've taken, they've so mastered this language and they have such incredible souls that they're bringing new ways of using it, new art forms, new rhythms, new uh, coinages, you know. Um, and so, you know, it's this whole process of you have to master the language, immerse yourself, and then, you know, be an artist, right? Be like a true artist. And of course, you can be a great jazz improviser and, you know, not be of that same incredible, soulful, original level as Thelonious Monk or Bill Evans. Um, but I think we all want to aim yeah. that high, right? Like that's that's what the world needs. It doesn't need a schlub like me being like, hey, I can play some two five ones. <laughs> These people with incredibly original voices and incredible, incredibly original experiences to make these great contributions that keep us excited to be alive. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's, it's a matter of immersing yourself and then <laughs> also finding something original to say, um, at least in my world. Would you say the same is true in your world? It, it yeah, it, it really is. You have to spend, you have to spend the time where you follow in the footsteps and you learn the basics and there's a lot of rote stuff. There's one thing we do called rule of the octave which is just a base ascending descending scale major and minor that has a given harmonization to every scale degree. And it's kind of a default basic functional language of classical music. And if you use that to a company like arias and just, you know, simple stuff, it would sound totally correct. Um, I was at a concert in uh, at the Lithuanian Academy, the, the string department had a concert and someone was doing a very virtuosic violin piece by Sada Sate. And I just started laughing because the, everything that happened was this basic language. Like, if the bass is this, then these are the upper voices. If the bass moves to here, do this. The entire thing was just this default language, uh, which, which cracked me up because, you know, apparently all the intelligence went into the violin part and the accompaniment was written at like a student level. So anyway, yeah, everyone everyone learns rule the octave, and they don't go on until their rule the octave is absolutely flawless. Um, when I've taught Partimento class, they don't get to come to the first day of class until they can do RO, we call it RO, in every key, ascending, descending, with a metronome, no mistakes. They don't even get to join the class until they can do that. Um, but yeah, eventually, eventually RO just becomes something you used to do a lot when you were a student. And now you have all this constellation of options and solutions. And the creativity is in how you combine and alter and um, play with all the variables. Uh, that's, that's really where they... Let, let me ask you a question. And I, I know we probably need to wrap up somewhat soon. So feel free to, to cut me off. But that... that gives me kind of an interesting thought, which is that one of the things that happens a lot in jazz education um, is that we take these, we take different eras of jazz. Um, and, you know, as a student, especially, you know, if you're a really good student, you kind of learn how to play a little bit, at least in the style of each of these eras and the style of different pianists, you know, you learn some amount of stride piano, um, and to play like James P. Johnson or Teddy Wilson or Fats Waller, you learn, uh, you know, how to play in a, 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 a Count Basie style big band and how to imitate that, maybe a little bit of Boogie Boogie, you learn Bill Evans' style, maybe some Oscar Peterson, some Monk, and then you go into the modal era and you learn McCoy Tyner's style. And then, you know, a lot of pianists these days are super interested in people like Brad Meldo and Robert Glasper and, um, you know, all these folks. And then the theory of the case, at least, is that our best musicians take all of those influences, kind of put them into a blender, and out comes an original artist, 
right? Um, and I, I, you know, I think it's good. I think that's how everybody learns. Right? You have to imitate before you can um, then go and, and make something new. If you're just trying to invent your own thing without having done the work, then you're probably not going to come up with something that has a lot of substance to it. But I, I guess my question for you, because I know um, you're, you're talking about this single school, but I imagine now you're writing about a few, you're talking about a bunch of different styles, eras, approaches. Is it legit, <laughs> for lack of a better word, to then come in and have an original approach that combines some things from the 16th century, some things from the 17th century? Or do you feel like, you know, these are historical um, practices that kind of should kind of remain in isolation, right? And then, of course, you know, if you broke out into bebop in the middle of that, um, yeah. you know, <laughs> like, is there that mixture? Like, is that possible? Or would that kind of be against, against the rules here? Um, I, I think I'm afraid of the same thing you're afraid of, which is just kind of this bizarre, cheesy mishmash that has no um, logical common thread. So no, I really wouldn't start with a Bach fugue type of thing and then go into a boogie woogie. You know, that, that to me, is, if somebody else wants to do it. That, that's a ridiculous example. But, yeah. You no, know, there are things that are more adjacent that just like we could mix Monk and Bud Powell, and it wouldn't yeah. raise any eyebrows. You know, like is that a thing that people can kind of mix some of these styles, or are they really pretty separate? You, you, you can, uh, uh, and and especially when they're adjacent, that isn't that that usually is historically real because that's how people always have been. They took a little of what they did yesterday and a little of today, and here's something that might happen tomorrow. And um, you know. So if you're playing along in a very strict 18th century style, um, like an earlier Germanic 18th century style, and suddenly you throw in an augmented six chord, some people are going to go, what? what? And other people are not even going to notice um, because they wouldn't detect the differences between those styles. So, you know, it's just it's a matter of personal preference. I think the the thing that really happens is maybe less in terms of putting things together in the same piece and more in terms of you, you get this view of how they thought and how they developed their abilities in, in that era and this era and in jazz. And, and you start to become a really good problem solver in different styles of music. Um, you, you start to realize very quickly, if I'm going to go on stage and I want to do this particular style, here are the things that had better be nailed down in my head. Mm -hmm. So I do some contemporary improvisation uh, on the same programs. Like I'll improvise on, um, don't tell anyone, but I'm going to do, I'm going to do play that funky music white boy. Um, and what I'm thinking about, yeah. Uh, what I'm thinking about is like the way that meld out would take a song that may or may not really have a great set of changes. And instead it'll take rhythmic motives or melodic motives and string those together in this harmonically free thing. And I'm very interested in that with, with one of these riff based kind of funky sounding songs, because the rhythmic element is so strong and so recognizable. Um, and we haven't really talked about audience recognizing moments, but that's an incredibly important thing. And actually I find that I'm drawing on the historic stuff all the time. Um, like, Mm. Even though you don't have to treat dissonance the same way, um, the idea of inside and outside playing is, is sort of analogous to that. Like, how long do I want to set up this jarring sound? And then when do I want to provide a tonal relief from it? And, and they very much speak to each other, these, these different styles. So um, it's just a little bit harder to explain how maybe sometimes. Uh, the inside outside analogy makes total sense to me. And mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we could, we could simplify basically everything in music to being tension and release. Right. Yeah. And I think, I think the point that you're making uh, in on some, don't let me put words in your mouth, but on some level is 
one of the things that defines different eras and different styles is what kinds of tensions are allowed right. and how long and in what ways we can release them, right? And so whether that's, you know, in the context of, well, a four to three suspension is a lot of tension, right? Or whether it's in like, wow, playing a half step above the chord is a lot of tension, you know, uh, yeah. those things remain constant. And if you can be intentional about the ways that you're creating tension, regardless of the style, um, then you start uh, being able to play, again, I guess, very intentional, you, you know, and you're going to have a lot more control. I think yeah. that's, is that kind of what you're saying? Absolutely. Uh, and, you know, I would hesitate to say that I know anything universal in music that covers all ages. And, you know, who, none of us knows that. But I think this idea of tension and release is as close as we can get. Uh, it's very interesting, you know, a, a lot of the Italian treatises from the 18th century would start with a, with a single statement. First sentence in them was, music is made of consonance and dissonance. Like, that is the recipe of music. Um, goes, yeah. <laughs> and, the, and the rest of the treatise is not theoretical at all. It's very practical. It's not philosophical. They were not into that. They just wanted to get you playing. But they would take time to say this one thing. Uh, and, and I find that absolutely fascinating because that's what I'm hearing in, in Keith Jarrett and Bill Evans and Brad Meldow and in, and in your playing too. You're very, very aware of this because um, you're this literary guy and you write these kind of art songy things and, and to have the human voice on a certain syllable, just like lean into a thing that's kind of ouch. And then there it's released. I mean, that's, it, that's totally a part of your music. Yeah, I'd say it's a part of anybody's music yeah. is it's just, yeah, managing um, and, you know, not just harmonically, but rhythmically, mm -hmm. tension, you know, and tension in terms of, you know, we imagine higher notes as more tense because on most instruments, it's more difficult to go higher. Right. Um, you know, I've been working on, on ballads with a lot, of, a lot of my students and talking about some, some of my heroes and how they'll, you know, on a ballad solo, they'll do something that's harmonically kind of a little bit out, rhythmically accelerates and then goes up the piano kind of all at once to provide this kind of like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, you know, to use, I don't know about all, but to use many of these, and usually they're also crescendoing, decrescendoing, right? Mm -hmm. Another like way that we, you know, kind of tonally, volume wise, however you want to classify that, you know, create tension and release. So, um, yeah, I think that uh, that's at the core of just about all music, um, but maybe not some modern stuff. <laughs> yeah. But I think on some level, it's it's got to be there. John, I feel like I could talk to you all day, and it's <laughs> this hour has flown by. <laughs> yeah. Why Why did you move to the West Coast so we can't hang out as much? I have not forgiven you for that little move. <laughs> There's a lot of room for you here. Okay. I can't tell you that it's cheap, uh, but the well, weather's good. <laughs> Yep. So I, so I hear it's yeah. so great to talk to you, Jeremy and to catch up a little bit and yeah, uh, like look forward to see you again soon. Yep. Talk to you next time. Goodbye, my friend. All right. Sounds good.